Today on the Bander Says Podcast, I will be addressing a whole bunch of your audio-related questions, so go ahead and stick around. Today, we are going to be addressing a lot of your questions that have been sent in over the last couple of weeks, but first we are starting with what I have been testing, and you are listening to it right now. I alluded to the fact that I may be one of the only podcasters using this specific microphone, and maybe even this type of microphone. This is a ribbon microphone. This is the AEA KU5A. The thing that sets this apart from a lot of other ribbon microphones is the fact that it is not a figure eight. It is a super cardioid, so it does a much better job at rejecting sounds from the rear of the microphone. Now, while I am recording this, I do have the high-pass filter engaged because... With ribbon microphones, they are very, very dark. So to demonstrate that, I have now shut off the high-pass filter so you can hear the low frequency, how warm and robust and thick it is down there. But the thing that's really special about ribbon microphones is how smooth they are. Yes, they are very dark. They don't have the same articulation in the top end. But they sound really nice and unique especially if you're going for that soft, smooth, more vintage sound. I think they work extremely well for that. Now I have switched the high-pass filter back on on this microphone, and over the last month, I have recorded a few songs with this. The two that I did were the You've Got a Friend in Me cover and Fly Me to the Moon by Sinatra. And for those two songs, I just did vocals and ukulele, And it worked tremendously on both of them. Yes, it is a very low mid forward sound, but to my ears, that just sounds incredible. So I want to hear what you think of this microphone, especially for spoken word and especially for podcasts. Do you think this sound is appropriate? Do you think it is flattering? Or do you think that podcasts need that super detailed clarity in the upper end or does something soft like a ribbon microphone is it viable as a podcasting microphone i can tell you that i really liked it on my voice for singing so we will see how it works for spoken word let me know in the comments or send me an email askbandrew at gmail.com and we'll go from there that is it for what i've been testing Let's jump to what you had to say, and I will share some feedback that we got regarding microphones for lower register bass voices. The first one comes from Grayton Newman. They say, I have really loved my AT4040 for lower register voices. Just a very smooth low end, especially for spoken word, but the sound signature carries over. We also got a comment from Seal Family Ministries, and they say, For bass singers, one of the greatest and best known, even George Younts, used an RE16 a lot. Some also use a small diaphragm condenser mic at an angle and a windscreen. And the last comment on this topic comes from Psy Sings Bass. They did talk about some other stuff, but I want to focus on the bass voice microphone comment. As for the bass voice mic, I should do some videos. Ha ha. <laughs> why, did, <laughs> why, why would anybody say, ha ha? <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> I, <laughs> I am so stupid. <laughs> Anyways, two broad things you can do with bass voice, in music that is, high pass and gentle wide cue cut with EQ or arrange, mix the songs around the voice. It really depends on how much body you want in the timbre of the voice and how resonant your voice is. Jeff has a way more resonant voice than mine, so it would be appropriate for him to be further away from the microphone than I would be. Resonance is somewhat inherent, but extra resonance can be learned. Another factor you want to consider is how bright or dark your voice is, regardless of your voice type. The brightness slash darkness comes from the harmonics above the fundamental and depends on your inherent structure of your body as well as the vowel and how you're pronouncing that vowel. I can make a D2 bright or dark depending on the vowel I choose and the vowel is dependent on larynx height, pharynx shape, tongue position, and mouth opening. Also, the tessitura in which you are singing, speaking, any particular note will affect how bright or dark the voice is. Higher in the vocal range tends to be brighter and vice versa. 
Different mics have different proximity effects, it seems. The mics I have the most experience with, Rode NT1A and AT2035, differed. The Rode had a larger proximity effect at the same distance, but its proximity was also more pleasing compared to the AT2035. I find the high pass on the 2035 is a bit too strong, so I EQ and post instead. The Rode also seems to be better at stacking lots of background vocals at the expense of the overly hyped high end. Thank you all so much for those amazing comments. It is incredible that you are willing to share your experience and your expertise, especially on topics that I have no real experience in. I don't mic up bass singers because I don't know anybody. (laughs) I don't talk to people and I don't have a bass voice. So I love that you're all willing to share information with folks so that I can pass it along and hopefully help people make better decisions. I want to demonstrate something that Sai Sings mentioned in his comment, and that's that you may be able to sing the same note and you can sing it bright or dark. I am going to try to sing the same note twice. I will sing it poorly, but I will demonstrate what he is talking about. Oh, would be dark. Oh, or E would be much brighter. It's much more nasally. You can do a lot more things. A lot of pop singers use a brighter tonality to their voice. Oh, as opposed to, oh, I sang it lower, but you get the point. You just by the shape of your mouth, the shape of your throat, the pronunciation that you're using, you can get quite drastically different sounds. A lot of classical music, you hear this as the opera sound, oh, just wide open and very dark sounding. Just found that very interesting. But now let's jump to my favorite part of the show, the Ask Bandrew segment. All righty, welcome to the Ask Bandrew segment. If you have any questions that you want answered on this podcast, you can go to askbandrew.com. There are instructions on how to submit audio, video, or text-based questions. I do prefer audio or video because then I don't have to read, and we get to hear how you sound on microphones, which is so much fun all the time hearing people's different recordings. We are going to start with an audio submission, so go ahead and take it away. Hello, Bandrew. I have a question for you. I recently bought the Zoom H6 audio recorder, and I noticed that every single one of the four channels has a minus 20 dB pad to it. Now that made me wonder, why would you need a minus 20 dB pad if you could just adjust the gain appropriately? I hope you can help me out there. I appreciate you, and have a good day. Thank you so much for that question. To answer it, there are very, very loud sound sources. Alan from SoundSpeeds just did a video on miking up gunshots, and he used an AR-15, I believe it is, and he says that that sound source can exceed 160 decibels. So no matter what microphone you're using, that is going to clip the preamp or the analog to digital converter So you would need to have a pad. You may also need to have a limiter. Drums are also another very, very loud sound source. Or if you are miking up a guitar cab and the guitar amp is a 100 watt all tube and the volume is cranked to 100% or 10 or 11, whatever your amp has, it can get extremely loud. So you do need to have the option to attenuate the signal before it hits the A to D converter, before it hits the preamp. And that's also why you sometimes see microphones that have pads, because you can overdrive the actual capsule, which sometimes peak out at 140. It is, is the Max SPL. Some have 120, 117, I think. The U67 is 117. The U87 is 127. So if you are using those microphones to mic up really loud sound sources, You may run into some issues and you may need to have a pad on the microphone or at the very least, a pad at the preamp level. I hope that answered your question. Thank you so much for for answering it, for asking it. Next question comes from Judy. They say, Hi, Bandrew. I am really enjoying your review videos on YouTube, which I find very useful. 
After much research, I have purchased the Motu M2 audio interface, but now I notice on the manufacturer's website that there is a PC system requirement of a large hard drive, at least 500 gigabytes for recording. That's a lot of hard drive for a typical laptop, and I have about half of that on mine. I was wondering why that requirement is so high. I've looked around and also noticed that no other audio interfaces you reviewed have any such hard drive requirements. Can you explain this? Thanks again for your work and great advice. Best regards, Judy. Judy, thank you so much for sending in that email. What an excellent, excellent question. It may seem a little bit silly for them to include that requirement on their spec sheet because the hard drive space you have on your computer has no impact on whether or not you're going to be able to use the Motu M2 with your computer. My thought process on why they may be including it is because you're able to record high-res audio files with that interface, and high-res audio files take up a lot of space. I went ahead and found a table, and it shows me that 24-bit, 192 kilohertz audio files are 66 megabytes per one minute of stereo. So if you have multiple stereo tracks recording into your DAW, that can eat up a lot of space very quickly. If you just have one terabyte of storage and a standard album, you can only store 320 albums in one terabyte with 24-bit 196 kilohertz, I'm sorry, 192 kilohertz uh, format. And that's assuming 45 minutes of uncompressed music per album. So in conclusion, I don't think that you actually do need 500 gigabytes of hard drive space to use this interface. That's silly of them to include that. I think that is them just trying to prepare folks for the file sizes that you will encounter if you are recording 24-bit 192 kilohertz, and it can and will eat up a lot of your hard drive space very quickly. But if you're recording in... 16-bit or 24-bit 48 kilohertz, you're looking at 16 and a half megabytes per stereo track. So it's a lot more conservative in the amount of space that it takes up. And for podcasts, 24-bit 48 kilohertz is perfectly fine. You're never going to run into any issues. You're never going to need more than that. And if you're doing high-res audio, then you may need to consider a larger hard drive. Judy, great, great question. I hope that helped you. Next, we got a question from uh, one of my favorite Brits out there. I love this man so much. Donald Wonder, take it away, good sir. If you don't know, Donald Wonder, host of the Voice of Mail podcast. That is voiceofmailmail.com. Check it out. Take it away, you wonderful, wonderful man. Andrew Scott, it's your boy Donald Wonder back again, just with a product shout, something I've seen online that seems to be gaining a bit more steam, and I like it in concept. It's a platform that beginner podcasters might really like because of a few of its standout features. I know some people really like their podcast transcribed. Uh, wouldn't really work for my podcast because we're just all over the place, but I think something more, a more serious project might like it. There's a product out there called Descript, that's D-E-S-C-R-I-P-T. If you Google it, it's the first thing that comes up to do with podcasting. And basically, it transcribes your podcast for you automatically. But more interestingly, when you go to edit your podcast, it edits it in a, in like a Word document. Like all the, once it's transcribed the podcast, if you go and delete words, it edits the podcast as a Word document. So no waveform cutting, you know, whether you're using GarageBand or Audition, you're not doing it the, the waveform way. You're doing it as a text document. I went on YouTube to see how it is in action. I've seen some people that might be shitting for the product, but from what I can see, it looks pretty good. And I think someone that is really, that really doesn't like to edit will just, the learning curve seems really, really simple. So I think it's a really cool product. They have integration with Zoom as well. And uh, lastly, the price seems really awesome. Really, I thought I saw like 10 bucks, 10 pounds, wherever you are in the US or UK. So I'm like, competitive pricing, unique features, seems professional, online naughty tracking that I went on before. And um, I think they are using the high codec for the recording as well. So I think they're using Opus. 
So yeah, Bandrew, what do you think? Have you seen it? Anyone listening? Would it stand out to you guys? It's not something I'm going to buy myself, but I think someone might get use out of it. And Bandrew, if you already heard of it, what do you think of it? Or if you mentioned it before, sorry for wasting your time. All right, guys, stay safe. Peace out. Thank you so much, Donald. Donald is always looking out for us, always throwing these new services out there and recommending we check them out. I had heard of this service from a bunch of the podcasts about podcasting that I have listened to, but I never used it until today. Based on Donald's recommendation, I signed up for Descript. I downloaded the software, which I hate doing because now Descript knows everything about me because they have access to my computer Descript, don't steal all of my don't steal all of my stuff. But I went ahead and did some samples. Here are the samples. Let's listen to it. All right, so I have downloaded and signed up for Descript so we can see how this thing works. I have a very quick MP3 recording that I made so we can see how the transcription and the editing of the transcription actually works. So let me go ahead and drop it in there if it will allow me to. There we go. And it pops up with this option to transcribe. I want it to transcribe that, so I will go ahead and hit that. And it will go ahead and begin the transcription process. I'm going to edit out however long it takes, and I will let you know how long it takes to transcribe a 30-second audio sample. All right, so in total, it took about 30 seconds for Descript to transcribe that 30 second audio recording. So near real time, looking over the transcript, it looks like it is almost exactly accurate. I will go ahead and play the audio sample and we can see how accurate it was and if it screwed up the sound at all. So let's listen back to this right now. Okay, this is a very quick test recording. I am recording way too high of a resolution and it will take forever to upload to Descript's service, but we will test this to see what it's like if I were to say, Google Gabu, Gubu Gabu, one of us, one of us. I don't want that in there anymore. Let's cut it out using the word editing and see how it ends up sounding. There you go. 30 seconds of audio recording to edit in Descript. Cool. So Descript seems to be pretty dang accurate at transcription. But now let's see what the real selling point is where we can edit the audio based on the transcript. I want to cut out the quote from Freaks where I say, Gobble, 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 one of us, one of us. Let's cut out these two sentences here and deleted. Now let's go ahead and play from the prior sentence and see how that edit sounds. I'm recording way too high of a resolution and it will take forever to upload to Descript's service, but we will test this to see what it's like. There you go. 30 seconds of audio recording to edit in Descript. Cool! All right. It makes sense. It did the edit that I asked it to do. However, it is not a clean edit. It is clear that it is edited. Let's try something else. Let's try copying cool and placing that somewhere else and see if that works. <laughs> see how it sounds. Test this to see what it's like. Cool! There you go. 30 seconds of audio recording to edit in Descript. I think that actually worked out pretty well, but at the very end of the phrase to edit in Descript, you can tell that I was going to say another word and that I, it was cut off. So there is an issue here. Let's go ahead and also just try to delete random words and see how that affects the recording, if it has any kind of weird algorithm to make the words flow into each other. I don't want to have very in there. I want it to say this is a quick test recording. Let's see how this sounds now. Okay, this is a quick test recording. I am way too high of a resolution and it will take... Let's see if we can make myself say something crazy. Here is my modified recording. Let's see how this sounds. Okay, this is a quick test recording. I am way too high. Cool! There you go. 30 seconds of audio recording to edit in Descript. All right, that is a very quick rundown of Descript. 
I understand the use case for this. The transcription is excellent, but when you are editing words out or cutting out just one or two sentences, it does seem to get a little bit difficult to do that properly and get good sounding or natural sounding edits. That is where a professional podcast producer would come in and have to really fine tune the edits. Somebody like Chris Curran from the Podcast Engineering School. He would be a lot better at editing out specific phrases or changing out words and making it sound natural as opposed to just basing off of text. Now, if you are just looking at the transcript and you decide, I don't want this entire section in, the, in there, I don't want this entire paragraph in there, I think it would be extremely useful. But if you are just trying to finally edit a show, not 100% sure if this would be my first go-to. If you don't have the tools, if you don't have the knowledge to edit it properly in a DAW, sure, I guess. But there you go. I just wanted to demonstrate this. And Donald Wonder, what a great suggestion to check this out. I successfully made it sound like I said I am way too high, which I am not. I don't do drugs. <laughs> but that's funny and terrifying. Okay. There you go. Donald, thank you so much for the suggestion. Next, we have an email from Robert, and he says, Good afternoon. I just bought the Samson G-Track USB microphone, and I have an Apollo Twin, but I cannot use the Apollo Twin just for the sound for my monitors while using the USB microphone. I'm having trouble setting this up. Do I have to run the monitors directly to my laptop? Robert, thank you very much for the email and the question. You do not need to run your monitors directly out of your computer. If you're on Windows, you would go into your sound preferences and you should be able to adjust the audio input and the audio output. You would want your audio input to be the Samson G-Track Pro, G-Track USB microphone, and you would want your audio output to be the Apollo Twin. Same story on Mac. You would go into your sound preferences and there are audio input and audio output options. Audio input would be the Samson G-Track, and audio output would be, the, would be the Apollo Twin. Then, if you're in your DAW, you would be able to do the exact same thing. You have to set the audio input and the audio output to two separate devices. I'm not going to be able to demonstrate this because it's different in every single DAW, but you would go to sound preferences in your DAW, Audio input would be the Samson G-Track. Audio output would be the Apollo Twin. And then you should be able to monitor everything and record and do all that. One thing that I would be concerned with with this setup is recording into the Samson G-Track and then having studio monitors playing and capturing the bleed from those monitors. So it may it just make sure that you mute your monitors, the actual speakers, while you're recording Otherwise, it will bleed into the microphone, and that would not be good. So I hope that helped you. There's not anything that should be keeping you from using the G-Track Pro or the G-Track as your audio input and the Apollo as your output, and then using the Apollo to control your monitors. Nothing should be stopping you from doing that. If you do still have problems, maybe send in a quick video, do a screen capture, and show me how you're setting it up and then we can work through that. Hope that helped, Robert. Best of luck to you. Next, we have an audio submission from somebody who's already been on the show, Ovid. <laughs> Take it away, Omid. Hey, Benju. Uh, my name is Omid Kamangar. Uh, you know me by the name of Ovid. <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, I wonder uh, what setup do you have for your camera? Because uh, you have two different cameras and uh, I wonder how do you connect them to your Mac and if you have a capture card and also what, what type of camera, what brand do you use and if you have any suggestions. Uh, thank you again and keep up the good work. Omid, thank you so much for the voice submission and thank you for having a good sense of humor for me being an idiot <laughs> and <laughs> mispronouncing your name as Ovid because like I said last time, I got COVID on the brain. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. I shot a very quick tour of the cameras. I do not connect the cameras or record the cameras directly to my Mac. I have them set up where they are recording to the SD cards. 
Then, when I am done recording, I take the SD cards out of the, the cameras, put them into my computer, copy the files over, and then sync the audio and video in Final Cut Pro. But with that being said, I do have a single Elgato cam link and an HDMI to micro or mini HDMI cable. And I do use one of my Canon 90Ds as a webcam when I do live streaming because once I've looked at my webcam from a Canon 90D and compare it to a built-in web webcam, it's atrocious, the built-in webcam, so I cannot use that. And the cam link makes it super easy. It works with every single software that I've thrown at it, and I am thrilled with it. And now I sound like an Elgato fanboy, but that is how I do it. The lenses I use, the Sigma 18 to 35, I believe, and the Canon 10 to 18 is the wide angle bird's eye view of the studio. Omid, thank you so much for that question. I hope that answered it. If you have any questions, feel free to send in another email. Send me a tweet. I do have all of the gear that I use listed on bandrewscott.com slash gear if you want to check that out. And yeah, let's jump to another email. This comes from Watch Games. They say, I hope this email finds you and your family in good health. Thank you so much, Watch Games. I hope you and your family are in good health as well and staying safe out there. He continues, I like your videos and learned a lot of useful things, but I'm still far away in understanding what does this and that on the sound coming from the microphone, like the threshold, the gain, etc. Some mics need more gain, others less. How to know which interface or amplifier that specific microphone needs. What all of this things do. Cloud lifter, preamp, amplifier, interface, mixer, you name it. I'm new to all of this stuff. What on earth do we need all of this stuff for? I record my gameplay with commentary. I have an Audio-Technica AT2020 USB+. Plus, Decent sound. When I plug it in, I need to go into control panel and bring the level down to 75%. Then I don't hear myself so much. How can I improve the quality and the gain on this mic if there exists any possibility since I want to YouTube and didn't find anything else besides the lower level? If I need to upgrade to XLR which I'm planning to do, what do you suggest to me in budget max of $1,000, including the mic and a USB interface and whatever else is needed? If less than $1,000, even better. Keep up the great work. Best regards, Tazi. All right, Tazi. Thank you very much for the email. Chock full of questions. First thing I will do is define all of those things that you listed. Cloud lifter, that is a preamplifier, a microphone activator, what that essentially does is it takes the output from a quiet microphone like the SM7B and adds 25 decibels of gain to it. So it turns, let's say it has an output of, your microphone has an output of negative 60 dBs. When you add the cloud lifter, now it has an output of negative 35 dB. So it is much easier to drive regardless of the preamp that you have in your audio interface. Next, what is a preamp? As I just mentioned, the SM7B has an output level of negative 60 decibels. That is too quiet. That is extremely quiet, and you would need a really powerful sound system to bring that up to any kind of listenable level. So a preamplifier takes the quiet output signal from a microphone and increases the level to get it to a listenable level and a level that you can actually work with in your recording software or on tape, whatever medium you're working on. Next, you ask about amplifier, but that does pretty much the exact same thing as a preamp. If you're talking about a stereo amplifier or a sound system amplifier or a PA amplifier, that is different. That is making the audio significantly louder and it is powering the speakers. Preamplifiers are just boosting up a signal of a microphone. That signal is still not going to be loud enough to power actual speakers. That is why you need an amplifier in front of a PA system, in front of your PA speakers. Then you ask about interface. An interface allows you to connect your microphone or your sound source to your computer, and it converts the analog signal, the sound signal, into a digital signal. So you're able to manipulate that new file on your computer. 
without an interface, you're not going to have that. Even with the 3.5 millimeter input jack on your computer, I would argue that that is kind of an interface because it does have an analog to digital converter, a crap one, but it is still there. An interface is essentially, you can think of it as a standalone box that allows you to connect sound sources to your computer. Mixer, same idea, but there are analog and digital mixers. An analog mixer would just be, it'll, it has a bunch of audio inputs and it allows you to, to adjust the level of each of those inputs and it would have outputs to run to an amplifier to go to a PA or to run to a tape machine, anything like that. A USB mixer would be the exact same thing as the analog mixer, but it has an analog to digital converter so you can run it to your computer. Now, as far as the AT2020 USB Plus, I recorded a quick sample and demonstration of that, so I will jump to that right now. All right, so I pulled out the AT2020 USB Plus. I have it connected to my Mac. This will be slightly different from Windows, but it should give you a general idea of how it performs. Currently, I am set at 38%, so pretty quiet on the gain. I will go ahead and set this to 100% which is what you said yours was default set to. Now my gain is at 100% and you should hear some kind of clipping and distorting. It sounds terrible. When we look at the meter, you can tell that it is in fact clipping. I will drop it down to 75% and you can see now that we are not quite clipping, but it is still a little bit too close for comfort. So I would go ahead and drop it down to maybe 50%, 50 to 60% to get a decent level. Now, if you're not hearing yourself, it could be that your monitor mix dial is not set properly. You can go between the microphone and the computer mix, which would be zero latency monitoring when you are all the way on microphone. And I can hear myself extremely well in my headphones. And then as I move towards microphone, or I'm sorry, computer, then I don't hear any of myself and all I would hear was the computer playback. So you can play with the mix dial to determine how much of your microphone you hear in your headphones. You can also adjust the microphone headphone volume on the mic and that's how I would do it. Additionally, a few weeks ago I made a video on setting your gain appropriately so you don't clip in OBS and I will link that in the episode notes and show notes so you can check that out. I think that will help you determine how you need to set your gain and how to set it up in OBS so you're not clipping there and you're getting a healthy level that is louder than the game sound. So there you go. Hope that helped. Great question. Best of luck to you. Let me know how it works out for you. And the last thing that you ask about is a setup recommendation under $1,000. I think interface-wise, two of the best options here would be the Motu M2 or the SSL2+. Plus. Then if you want to get really, really expensive, but this would eat up almost your entire budget, a Universal Audio Apollo X, but that's $900, so you don't have any money for your microphone. So I would go Motu M2 or SSL2 or 2 Plus. For microphones, that is much more difficult because I don't know what your voice sounds like. I don't know what your room is like. I don't know what your background noise is like. I don't know if you were just using it for gameplay and voiceovers or if you want to do music. I don't know if you do ASMR, if you need multiple polar patterns. There's a lot of information that I don't have, so recommending a microphone would be difficult. Some of the more popular microphones that I recommend the Electro Voice RE20, the SM7B is very popular, the AT2035 is pop popular, not my favorite, the Neat King B, a killer, no pun intended, a killer microphone, condenser mic, around 130 bucks, the SE Electronics SE4400A, the SEV7, the Warm Audio WA87, Go to, I will link this in the episode notes. I have a page on Podcastage where I update my favorite XLR microphones, and you can go check that out. And that's all the, those are my favorite microphones. If I had a mic locker and just a set number of microphones, these would likely be in the list. 
So there you go. That is my recommendation. Tazi, I hope that helped you. Great question. Very thorough email. Next, we have another voice submission. So take it away. Hello, Bandrew. It's me, once again, Aaron from the Philippines, to ask you another question. I uh, apologize if I keep asking you questions. It's just that I've recently become a curious cat, a very curious cat when it comes to microphone stuff. And uh, you really seem to be the go-to guy when it comes to stuff like this. So, uh, yeah, I apologize. Anywho, uh, today it's going to be a little bit controversial. My question is, what's the point of those broadcasting microphones like RE20s and SM7Bs. What's the point of those when stuff like live dynamic vocal microphones like SM58s and SM57s already exist? Like, I feel like from all my research that I've been doing recently, they seem to almost be exactly the same. They're both usually XLR microphones. They both... Um, they both have excellent background noise rejection. They both have almost the same frequency response. And listening to your reviews and comparisons, I could barely tell the difference between them. Granted, of course, I don't have good headphones, but I mean, for the general public, who does have really good, how many people actually do have really good headphones to be able to notice a difference? So my question is, why do people keep going for those really expensive $200, $300 broadcast dynamic microphones for stuff like podcasts when something for 100 bucks or even less, like those, even the Behringer XM8500, that's a really good example too, $20 and all of that. Those, those things exist. Why do people have to go for the really expensive ones that, in my opinion, do the exact same job. I, I hope I worded that correctly. I hope you got what I'm trying to say. Thank you. All righty, Aaron. Thank you so much for the question. What a great question. What is the difference between the large broadcast dynamics and the stage microphones? Why don't people just get the stage dynamic microphones? Because they sound pretty darn good, and they're a lot cheaper. You're absolutely right. Most people could probably get an SM58, an SE Electronics, SEV7, any handheld dynamic microphone, use it, and not get any complaints because a lot of them are very good sounding, they do great at background noise rejection, and they're small, they're built like a tank, so you don't have to worry about the build quality. So why... Do broadcast dynamics even exist? Because they're able to be more lenient with the size, they're able to add a lot more functionality or a lot more technology in them. I have the Electrovoice RE20 here, for example. On the side, you have a lot of vents, which allow for what is called variable D technology. And what that does is it limits the change in tone based on the proximity effect. So there should be minimal change as you get farther and closer away from your mouth in terms of the low end boost, which is the proximity effect. So without having a large body like this with the multiple vents along the side to allow different phases, I believe is, is how they do it. Without those vents, it wouldn't be able to do that. And with a handheld dynamic, there's just not enough space to do that. And handheld dynamics are meant to be held. So if it did have vents, your hand would cover them up and it would render that feature completely moot. The SM7B, for example, yes, it does have a similar capsule, I believe the Unidyne 3. So the SM7B and the SM58 and SM57, similar capsule, but the SM7B has a larger body and that allows for a enhanced low end response. It extends lower into the sub frequencies below 100 Hertz. So you get a fuller sound, especially if you're recording something that has a lot of low end information. My voice does not. So you're not going to notice that that much. And also the 7B has a 
upgraded mounting system for the capsule. So it should have less interference or less noise when you're touching it and moving it around compared to the SM57, SM58, stuff like that. It just allows these microphone companies to say, without any compromises for size, what can we do to make the best sounding microphone that we can for this application? Yes, most people can get a $100 handheld dynamic microphone and be perfectly fine, receive no complaints from their audience, from their listeners, from their viewers, and never have to upgrade again because the handheld dynamic sounds good. It's built to last. But a lot of people, when they get to a certain point, they just decide, I want the best of the best. And that's why a lot of people just go and buy a broadcast dynamic. It is a little bit of a status symbol. It is a bit of confidence boosting. It is also just, if I am putting a product out, I am going to try to make it as good as possible. And if there is a, a slight benefit from using something like an RE20 or an SM7B over an SM58, a lot of people are going to want to get that benefit and pass that along to their listeners and their viewers to give the listener and the viewer the best experience that they can possibly get. A Aaron, Aaron, thank you so much for that question. That was super fun to talk about, and I hope that answered it. If you have any additional questions, let me know. I am not a microphone designer, though, so I don't know all of the design choices and manufacturing processes that these microphones go through and exactly how it's different from a handheld dynamic but that is what I am able to garner from my testing, from my research online, and all of that. So thank you so much. And that is actually going to wrap up for this week. I know maybe a little bit shorter than usual, but hey, we're just answering questions right now. We're just hanging out, having a good time, talking about audio like a bunch of nerds that we are. Thank you so much for sending in those questions, everybody. Again, if you have questions you want answered, you want me to discuss, ask bandrew.com instructions on how to send that in until next week please stay safe stay away from people and you are an incredible person i will talk to you next week bandrew says.com geeksrising.com for other educational podcasts i will talk to you later let me know in the comments what did you think of the aeaku5a talk to you later bye bye This has been a Geeks Rising production. Your executive producer is Bandrew Scott. For more information, head over to www.geeksrising.com.